one thing that makes you angry? Um, just not being on time. Tell me one thing that makes you mad. When people lie. People lie to me. When my family comes in my bedroom without knocking on the door. One thing that makes me upset is when people say they're gonna call me and they don't call me back. I get upset sometimes when people people lie to me, they're not honest to me. It's the little things. Uh, nagging. Uh, it's something that just drives me crazy. You know, if somebody says they're gonna call you, you know, you know, if they don't call, that makes me. Telling me once is fine, but on and on and on, it's like, I don't know. Kind of reminds me of my mother when I was a child, I guess. What makes me angry is when people judge people by the way they look instead of getting to know the true person that they really are. People who don't hear themselves when they're speaking and aren't careful about what they say, aren't careful of their language. People that get in front of you when you're driving down the road and all of a sudden go really slow. Oh shit, get out of my way. People who aren't grateful for what they have. Um, people who aren't grateful to their friends or family members. Oh shit, get out of my way! Let's see, when my girlfriend keeps calling me non-stop on a afternoon when she knows I'm golfing. People who think it's okay to vent their own anger, uh, because it makes them feel good. It doesn't make other people feel good, and it's usually the beginning of cycles of anger. I got stabbed in the back. I'm a close friend of mine. Um, it happened recently, and, uh, you know, it's... It's um, it's kind of frustrating, you know, because you don't know the, the whole details about it and stuff like that. But when you hear from other people, so that's one thing that, you know. How do you deal with it when something like that happens? Well, there's only really one way to deal with it, and that's just to forget about it and let bygones be got bygones if you know, it doesn't happen all the time. Laugh it off at first. And then what? Then I think about it, and then I get upset. I might curse a little bit. You don't go punching people out? I know. I'm not about it. <laughs> I keep it inside for most of the time. I go somewhere where nobody's looking and slam things against the wall. Um, I try not to. I try to avoid situations where I'm dealing with people that I get lied to. I, uh, I've hit a few things before. <laughs> uh, kick the door, too, you know, things like that. First, you have to acknowledge the anger, realize, well, hey, you know, I'm really upset and I'm angry, so I'm not going to allow this to build up. My, my way of dealing with anger is actually through my car, is I just get in the car and drive, and it just seems to be the most soothing thing in the world to me. It might be, if it's somebody that made me angry, it might mean confronting them. I, sp I speak my mind, you know, I'm a little bit more open when it's someone like a friend or a relative, you know, I, I, I let them know how I feel. You know, as opposed to someone that I don't know, I just pretty much, you know, just stay to, stay to myself and try to keep out of their way. It's, it's a lot better to actually take care of the problem as soon as possible. Because when you let it fester, you can't do anything else, at least not well or not with your full um, attention. There's nothing that I allow to, to fester or stay within me because it, it could result into bitterness and hostility and a lot of other negative emotions. I'm glad you're here with us today, whether you're uh, here in Venue 1 or back in Venue 2 or Muscatine or watching with us online. But I think uh, we all agree one of the amazing things about the crazy makers in life is just how quickly they can flip you from having a good day to having a really crappy day. You know, you wake up in the morning, the sun is shining, Mr. Bluebird's singing on your shoulder, the flowers are swaying to your rhythm as you go by, and then these crazy makers come into your life and they managed to go from zero to three cats in a bag crazy in about 0.3 seconds, right? And all of a sudden, you're ready to kill something. And you don't even care what it is. Well, that's an anger issue. Do you know that the average woman loses her anger three times a week? <laughs> I did not take that survey. I cannot, I can either confirm nor deny the, the, the veracity of it. The average man loses his temper about six times a week. That one I'm pretty comfortable with. Um, women get angry more often at, at people. Men get angry more often at things like computers, cars, mechanical problems, etc. 
Women are more verbal with their anger. Men are more physical with their anger. Single adults express anger twice as often as married adults. I'm not even going to go there. Um, The place you're most likely to express anger is at home. Dr. S. I. McMillan has identified 51 illnesses that can be directly, excuse me, directly attributed or caused by anger. Now, as we start today, I want you to understand something about anger, and that is anger is not always an inappropriate response. It's not always an inappropriate response. Selfish anger is generally wrong. Uncontrolled anger is always wrong, but anger in itself is not wrong. In fact, there are some situations where anger is the only appropriate response. In some cases, anger is actually evidence of love. You know, if somebody's trying to break into my house to to hurt my wife or my daughter, they just roused the anger of Anthony Liston and Gaston Glock together. That's what's going to happen. You know, I'm going to go out there. I'm going to be angry about that. That's an appropriate response. If I don't get angry that someone is trying to hurt my family, what does it say about me and my family? Since I don't love my family. So there are some things we ought to get angry about. In fact, did you understand this? The only reason you can get angry is because God created you in his image and God has emotions too. 375 times in the scriptures it talks about God being angry. So there's some things you ought to be angry about. So being angry is not in and of itself wrong, but how we express it. So because God is angry and God does not sin, clearly... There's an appropriate way to deal with anger, and there's an inappropriate way to deal with anger. Now, in your notes, Ephesians 4, 26, 27, this is on that extra sheet there that's perforated. If you become angry, do not let your anger lead you into sin, and do not stay angry all day. Don't give the devil a chance. So the command isn't don't get angry. The command is what? Don't sin. Yeah, don't sin when you get angry. Proverbs 25, 28, if you cannot control your anger, you are as helpless as a city without walls and open to attack. In other words, you are defenseless. In other words, when you cannot control your anger, what happens is you let the crazy people live rent-free in your head. And then you spend all of your life reacting to them rather than controlling your choices. So the good news is, Oh, what is the good news? The good news is how you express anger is learned. And if you can learn something, what else can you do? You can unlearn it. You can replace it with something else. See, you learned your responses to anger from your parents, from your grandparents, from your aunts and your uncles, from some of the crazy makers maybe in your life. You learned it from television and Hollywood, but you can replace it. So let's dive in. Let's talk about this. Introduction. How anger shows up in our life. Now, Most of us are familiar with what's referred to, at least when I was growing up, as Irish anger, all right, which is explosive. It's volcanic. I don't even know if there are volcanoes in Iceland or Iceland, Ireland. (laughs) We're an eclectic family. Um, Yeah, so we're familiar with a person who just explodes. They just, everything goes thermonuclear instantly. But let me show you four other ways that you may not recognize as anger that happen in your life, all right? So you'll see these kind of people, and I've got some biblical examples of these people here, all right? So here's an example. Hey, the machine guns. The machine guns. These are people that got a hair trigger, and when when they react, they simply mow everything down, right? These are the Alec Baldwins and the Charlie Sheens of your family tree, right? In fact, the very first example in Scripture of anger is a guy who's got this hair trigger machine gun thing. He's been rebuked by God because he didn't follow God's instructions, and so God called him on it. Watch what he does, Genesis 4. Cain became furious, and he scowled in anger. When they were out in the fields, Cain turned on his brother and killed him. All right, here's the second kind, the mutes. They don't blow up, they clam up. They don't get violent, they go silent. And by the way, just for you ladies, I want you to understand something that probably, again, they will probably revoke my man card for telling you this. But when you give your husband the silent treatment, that is not punishment. (laughs) Now, I get get that in chick world, not speaking to each other, makes everybody go, oh, the universe is out of balance. No, in man world, when you don't talk to him when you're mad, 
that's a good thing as far as he's concerned, all right? So, yeah. But the problem with the mutes is they refuse to admit that they're angry. And they, they, they deny that they're angry, but eventually they have high blood pressure, they have chronic pain, they have tension headaches, they have ulcers, they have all these other anger-related effects to their body. Now, there's actually a prophet in the, in the Old Testament who's a good example of this. God told him to be silent, and even though God told him to be silent, being silent had the same effect on him that it has on someone who just chooses to be silent. This is uh, from Jeremiah. Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet. If Jeremiah were alive today, he would be medicated, all right? But he held in his anger. Jeremiah 15, I did not spend my time with other people laughing and having a good time. In obedience to your orders, I stayed by myself and was filled with anger. Why do I keep on suffering? Why are my wounds incurable? Why won't they heal? Does that sound like anybody you know? Sounds like your diary, does it? All right, here's the next group. The martyrs. They tend to be in-laws, all right? The martyrs. Martyrs are, are passive and they punish themselves. And when crazy makers come into their life though, here's what happens. They don't think, my mom is, my mom is nuts. They think, what's wrong with me? This must be my fault. Listen, the number one sign that you suffer from the martyr approach to anger is that you suffer from depression. You say, now wait a minute, I'm not depressed because, yeah. The number one cause behind Depression is anger. You're mad about something. You're mad about your situation. You're mad about your family. You're mad about your life. Listen, you can medicate and deal with some of those symptoms, but the problem is when your medicine runs out, what's wrong? The situation's still the same because you haven't dealt with it yet. Deal with the situation, right? Jesus describes this kind of, uh, of anger. He's telling the story of the prodigal son. So a young dude comes in and tells his dad, I want my inheritance early. I know you're not dead yet. I still want my inheritance. And he gets his money and he leaves and he comes back. Well, it's not that young man who has this martyrdom complex, okay? It's actually his big brother. Because now his big brother who's been there all the time is mad because dad's throwing a party for that little runt that ran off and spent all of his money and came back and now wants back in the family. Watch this, Luke 15. The older brother stalked off in an angry sulk and refused to join in. His father came out and tried to talk to him, but he wouldn't listen. I love it, because emotional martyrs, man. They always have to be coaxed. They always got to be handled with kid gloves. They just make sure that if they're not ha happy, ain't nobody going to be happy, All right? Next one, D, the manipulators. Their motto is, don't get mad. <laughs> get even. Yeah, you know, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of great man movies based on that premise, you know? Uh, anything with Mel Gibson, Harrison Ford, Vin Diesel, <laughs> Liam Neeson, it makes for a good movie. It makes for a horrible life. See, manipulators, they'll never tell you that they're mad at you face to face. What they'll do is they'll just punish you silently. And they'll use sarcasm and they'll use jabs and they'll use cuts and innuendo. And then when you call them on it, what do they say? Oh, come on, I was just joking. Can't you take a joke? Don't be so thin-skinned. There's actually a group of religious leaders that kind of did the same thing to Jesus in Luke 6. Jesus heals a man whose hand was deformed, and instead of being happy that the man's hand had been healed, watch what they do. They were beside themselves with anger and started plotting how they might get even with him. So, all right, how do you deal with these crazy makers who they just know how to push your button? I mean, how do you respond to them while not using inappropriate expressions of your own anger, right? The Bible gives us five really practical things here. Number one, I must calculate the cost of inappropriately expressed anger. Man, this is all through the book of Proverbs, especially. Proverbs 29, 22. An angry person starts fights. A hot-tempered person commits what? All kinds of sin. You think you're just getting even. No, you're, at, you're sinning. Proverbs 14, 29, if you stay calm, you are wise. But if you have a hot temper, you only show how, what? Yeah, circle that word. You may need that. That may need to jump out at you. You only show how stupid you are. So if I get angry, here's the deal. There's always a cost if I express my anger inappropriately. I'm going to get in trouble. I'm going to sin. I'm going to damage my relationships, and much of the time, I'm going to actually damage the relationship I'm trying to save. I'm going to damage the relationship that means the most to me. I mean, think about it. How many kids have been alienated from their parents because of some explosion dad had or mom had? 
How many people have been alienated from their closest friends because of some stupid explosion? See, there's always a cost when you, uh, when you express your anger inappropriately. There's always a cost in your real life. Now, number two, I need to look past their words into their pain. I need to look past their words into the pain. Now, I mentioned this last week, and I want to just touch on it again here today. Listen, if, if, you did, if you weren't here last weekend, you can go online and watch that. We talked about six things wise people don't do in their relationships. It's one of the few sermons you'll ever hear me teach from where I'm actually giving you negative things, think, telling you not to do certain things. That's there. You really should see that. But what we've got to do is when someone starts hurting you, you've got to look past their pain and see what they're, why are they saying what they're saying? Proverbs 19, 11. A wise man's wisdom gives him patience. It is to his glory to what? Overlook an offense. Why? We said this last week. Hurt People hurt people. See, when somebody is hurting you, it's because they've been hurt and they're still hurting. When somebody's rude, when they're bitter, when they're unkind, when they're sarcastic, when they're mean-spirited, when they're arrogant, when they are attacking, their behavior is shouting, I am in pain in my life. I may not even understand that or understand why, but there is pain driving my life. Secure people, loved people don't act that way. They're, loved people are gracious. Secure people are very, very generous to other people. So you have to decide when they start punching that button, when they start punching your button, you got to ask yourself, am I going to overcome evil with evil or am I going to overcome evil with good? Am I going to behave the way Jesus wants me to behave or am I going to retaliate? You realize study after study after study after study shows that aggression only creates more aggression? Did you need a scientific study to understand that? What happens if one kid pushes another kid on the playground? Somebody else is going to get pushed, right? One time when I was in Oklahoma, I had a gal come into my office who she was upset about her whole life, and she could have just started making better choices, but they seemed out of her reach. Um, and so she came into my office, and and she sat down, she's talking to me about how frustrated her husband was, which is funny because I'd visited with her husband. Guess what we talked about? How frustrated he was with her, you know? <gasps> Shock. They would have never seen that coming in a marriage. And uh, so she's sitting there on my couch and she's talking. And then all of a sudden she starts stomping and kicking on my couch. As she turns around, she starts pounding on my couch and she lets out this, ah! I mean, this blood curdling scream. And I've got to tell you, I was absolutely thrilled that I had gone to the bathroom before she came into my office. <laughs> I mean, my heart stopped when she did this. I didn't know what was going on. It was like a scene from The Exorcist right there, you know. It was so bizarre. And when she, got, when she was done, I just looked at her and I said, okay, so let's talk about that. I knew a counselor once. And uh, so she looked at me, she said, my counselor says that when I get that frustration, the best way to get it out is to vent it through a primal scream. And I said, so, okay, how do you feel right now? And she goes, well, I actually feel more angry and my throat hurts. <laughs> yeah, you know, there's appropriate ways, there's inappropriate ways. Anger begets anger. If you, if you express your anger with anger, guess what happens to your anger? But if you choose to express peace, guess what peace begets? Peace. All right, number three. I need to think before reacting. Well, there's a news flash. I need to think before reacting. So when somebody starts pushing your buttons, and, and they may do it openly, they may do it secretly, but here's the deal. You gotta remember this. In fact, write this off to the side somewhere in your notes. Anger control is largely a matter of mouth control. Anger control is largely a matter of mouth control. Proverbs 13, 16, underline the first three words. Wise people, what? Well, there's the difference already. Wise people think before they act. Fools don't, and then they brag about their foolishness. Oh yeah, you should have heard what I told so-and-so at work today. Man, I let him have it. Proverbs 29, 11. Fools do what with their anger? Ah! Yeah. 
<laughs> but the wise quietly hold it back. Now, I was curious what the idea was behind quietly hold it back. Because we're told, oh, don't swallow your anger. Don't swallow your anger. You know, don't, 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 you need to express what's there. So I was curious, so I, I thought I'd do a little, a little work on it. You realize the Hebrew word that we translate, don't hold it back, is the same Hebrew word you would use to describe taking a piece of hot metal and dipping it in water to treat it, to cool it, which, by the way, guess what, hot, when you take steaming hot, when you take red hot metal and put it in water, you know what you do? You've increased the strength of the metal. It's the idea of cooling off something that is hot in that verse. So when you take your anger and you cool it off, it actually makes your character stronger. Isn't that interesting? Because what are we told? We're told, take it out and beat on it. <laughs> no, that's not what it says. Today, the way we would put it, instead of saying, but the wise quietly hold it back to stay true to that verse, what we might say is, but the wise choose to chill it. <laughs> the wise choose to just cool it. So how do we cool it? All right, I'm going to give you three questions here. Three questions to ask before responding. You work through these in your head when you need to respond. Number one, why am I angry? In other words, why does this bother me so much? Why, what's really behind why this bothers me? Is what they're doing really something for me to be upset about or what? All right, number two, what do I honestly want in this relationship? So this person I think I love... I think I want to have a relationship with they're pushing my buttons. And really what I want to do is I want to reach across the table and just slap them silly. But <laughs> will that produce what I want from this relationship? Now, having said that, let me give you one little thing in there you need to understand. Not all relationships are worth the effort. Do you understand that? Not all relationships are worth the effort. You don't have to have relationships with everyone. Not all of them are worth the effort they require. So you've got to ask yourself this question. This particular relationship, what's the Bible say about whether or not I maintain this? Number three, how can I move us toward what we really need together? I mean, how can I take our relationship to where I think we both want it to go? Now, you can't ask those questions if you're reacting immediately. But if you're quiet for a minute, you run through the list... You can think about them. Because what you're looking for, when we talk about that first one, why am I angry? We want to know what's causing this. That, that brings us to the next thing, B. Three basic root causes of anger. See, if you reflect before you react, if you think before you speak, you can a lot of times identify the root of their anger and your anger. And anger is always caused by one of three things. So we want to look past the anger and see what is the root cause. Here's the first one, hurt. Hurt, again, hurt people, hurt people. So when somebody's pushing your buttons, it may be that they're hurt and they're reacting out of their hurt. I'm trying to, trying. I started siding my house this week. So I'm up on my roof Friday and I'm at a place where I've got a, the eaves hang out over my garage. And so I'm up at a spot where between my roof of my garage and the bottom of my eave, I've got nine inches to get in there and nail siding. And so I'm squeezed up in there and I'm reached like this and I have my hammer and it's dark and I'm whacking away in there, you know, trying to get, trying to get this stupid nail and hold the siding in and it was not going. And so I thought, I'm just, I'm going to, I'm going to sink this puppy with one blow. And so I, bam, well, guess what? When you're working with your hands way over your head, lying down in the dark, totally extended out in nine inches of space, you're not a good shot. And I hit myself right between these knuckles, right here, as hard as I could go. That thing that, that bled so long. And I got to tell you, the first thoughts that came to my mouth when my, <laughs> when my hand sent me back the message that I had missed the nail, I was not going, well, praise Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. No. <laughs> That's not what was going on. What I did was I got angry. I got really angry. And thank God there was not enough room in there to swing that hammer or half my house would have been down, you know? <laughs> now why? Because hurt always creates anger. You know, man, I, got, I was angry at the nail. I was angry at the hammer. I was angry at both my hands. I was angry at the house. I was angry at the guy we bought the house from in 1997, you know? I was angry at anything that requires human maintenance whatsoever. I was angry at my life, everything. So what you got to do is realize you have to look past the anger and look for the cause. Look for what's hurting them. Why? Because it's easier to deal sympathetically with someone who is hurt than someone who is angry, right? So skip the anger and look for the hurt. 
All right, second reason, frustration. Frustration. I might have had just a little bit of that in that enclosed space. When you get frustrated, you get angry. When you can't control a situation, you get angry. So you ever hold an infant at 2.30 in the morning when they are absolutely inconsolable and you have worked through everything you know, you have changed them, you have tried to feed them, you have checked their ears, you have taken their temperature, you have looked to see if they're teething, you have gone through that entire list and you can't determine what's wrong with them and society says you can't do anything to them. (laughs) You had that thought, don't you lie to me. That's a little frustrating, isn't it? And then at about 2.35, you realize just how much you love your mother because you're still alive. Because if you had your way, this one might not live to your age, right? All right, so frustration. All right, next one is fear. When you feel threatened, when you feel attacked, when you feel afraid, you fight back. You take any animal, whether it is wild or domesticated, and you force it into a corner and you threaten it. What's it going to do? It's going to bite you. Thomas Jefferson wasn't necessarily a theologian, but I like what he said about anger. He said, when you're angry, count to 10. If you're really angry, count to 100. (laughs) That's actually pretty wise advice. What would that look like for us? Don't immediately text back. Don't immediately respond to that email. Quit following that Facebook discussion. Sleep on it. Count to 10. What do you do during that delay? Why am I angry? (laughs) What do I honestly want in this relationship? How can I help us move toward what we really need? So when you're doing that counting, you start working your way through those questions. Because the more you understand, the more understanding you'll be. All right, number four. Oh, man, I got to fly. Number four. I need to count, I need to control my tongue and its volume. You ever notice that the louder you talk, the angrier you get? The quieter you talk, you know, use your indoor voice, you know. The quieter you talk, the more you calm down. Proverbs uh, 17. A truly wise person uses few words. A person with understanding is even tempered. Now, by the way, I saw a a tweet from a loser from Adventure last weekend that said, Pastor Tony said he once wanted to wedgie an old woman. (laughs) Now, in defense of myself, that's not exactly word for word what I said. I will grant you it is close, but that is not exactly what I said. And what I did say was, I confess that that was a wrong, inappropriate expression of anger, right? That was a bad thought. That was, I was not giving you permission to go wedgie little old ladies at cafes all around the Quad Cities. That will come back to get me. But I learned something. You know, as a person who speaks publicly all the time, I noticed this crazy principle. I cannot put my foot in my mouth if my mouth is closed. Is that genius or what? Yeah, and neither can you. Hey, this next verse, read it out loud with me. Psalm 141, three, here we go. Lord, help me control my tongue. Help me be careful about what I say. I love this from, from Paul writing to the Galatians. He's talking about the, the, fruit of, the fruit of the Spirit. He says, but the Spirit produces the fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. In other words, when I am filled with myself, when I am filled with Tony, I'm so full of Tony, I don't have room for love, joy, peace, patience. I don't have room for, I don't have room for the Holy Spirit. And I do stupid things. But if I'm filled with the Spirit, I don't have room for me. And my behavior changes because I'm filled with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and so on. So how do I get filled with the spirit when it's my spirit that's trying to fill me up because I'm angry? Well, don't make it too complicated. You got a three-word prayer that you pray all the time that you should use intentionally at that moment. It goes like this. God, help me. (laughs) God, help me. 
It's probably second in your prayer list, only behind God, no, <laughs> right? All right, number five, I need to base my identity in Jesus. I need to base my identity in Jesus. You've got to change how you identify yourself. You've got to base your identity on Jesus. The fact that he loves you unconditionally, that you're his, that you're valuable, that he's got a purpose, he's got a plan for your life. If you try to build your identity on being anybody else other than his, you are going to struggle with insecurity your entire life. And until you start feeling secure about your relationship with him, people who like to push your buttons are going to be able to dominate your life because anger and insecurity all go together. And the more insecure you feel, the more vulnerable you are to the button pushers. We're going to, near the end of this series, I think like three or four weeks, we're going to have a, uh, we're going to do a lesson about how to not be a people pleaser. Anybody struggle with being a people pleaser? Yeah, don't miss that one. All right, but watch this. Proverbs chapter 29, he's talking about being a people pleaser rather than being a God pleaser. Fearing people is a dangerous trap, but trusting the Lord means what? Safety. See, if you're worried what other people think all the time, you're always going to have an emotional challenge. You're always going to be insecure, and anger is always going to be stirring just below the surface. Ephesians chapter 1. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we're united with Christ. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the glorious grace he's poured out on us who belong to his dear son. He's so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. He has showered his kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding. So what's my reaction to that to be? To understand who I belong to. I'll let him be the center of my identity. Matthew chapter 5. In a word, what I'm saying is, grow up. I love that because in English it's two words. <laughs> in the Greek it's one word. In a word, what I'm saying is, grow up. You're kingdom subjects. Now live like it. Live out your God-created identity. Live generously and graciously toward others the way God lives toward you. See, when you're living out your God-given identity, you'll be generous and you'll be gracious to others no matter what they do to you, no matter how many times they push your buttons. Why? Because you're living out your God-given identity, not who they're trying to make you be. They don't determine who you are. God determines who you are. You know what the most practical, simple logical way to start your new identity is baptism i'm not talking about baptism when you were too young to know anything about it and it wasn't your choice i mean jesus let's face it jesus was dedicated at the temple but when he became a full-on adult what did he do he was baptized it says he was baptized to fulfill all righteousness by the way it means he was immersed in water that's the actual word he made an adult profession of his faith, and that's what we're talking about. He went down to the Jordan River, and he was immersed in the Jordan River. And Scripture says he modeled that to show us that we need to do that too. Paul describes it like this in Romans 6. He says, don't you know that all who share in Christ Jesus by being baptized are also sharing his death? When we were baptized, we died and were buried with Christ. We were baptized so that we would live a new life as Christ was raised to life by the glory of God the Father. Let me tell you, if you've not ever done that, you've got multiple chances to do it. We have, last week we used our new baptistry for the very first time down that corner that's behind that screen. We baptized three people last week and we can baptize 24 hours a day. You want to be baptized at 1.37 in the morning on Tuesday night, you call me and we'll do it. Now if it's Saturday night, I'm a little tired, um, but we'll get somebody who'll do it, all right? Uh, we're going to have big baptisms out at the lake uh, the last Sunday of May. By then, the water should not have any ice on it, okay? But I want to encourage you to look at doing that. That's starting your identity. All right, would you pray with me? Let me lead you in a prayer today about what we've talked about. You put it in your own words. There's nothing magical about it. I'm just kind of giving you a guide to work through here as you're learning to pray. You can say, Father, I got people in my life who just absolutely flat punch my buttons. They drive me crazy, and Father, I admit that my first internal response is to want to slap them back and meet them tit for tat. 
But Father, today I'm asking for your help. help. Help me to reflect before reacting. Father, help me to learn to release my anger appropriately. Help me to find my identity completely in you. Father, take me into your family. Grow me as I serve you. Grow me as I study. For those of you that have never been baptized and need to do that, you can make a commitment to that today and say, Father, I, wanna, I also want to be just like Jesus. I want to be baptized to identify myself just like you commanded us to do. And so I, I open myself completely to you. Come into my life. Save me. Change me. Make the changes that only you can make. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.